So ladies and gentlemen, our next keynote speaker is Dr. George Friedman. Dr. Friedman is an internationally recognized geopolitical forecaster and strategist on international affairs. He's the founder and chairman of Geopolitical Futures, an online publication dedicated to explaining and forecasting the course of global events. Prior to 2015, Dr. Friedman was the chairman of Stratfor, a company he founded in 1996. He regularly lends his expertise on international affairs, foreign policy, and intelligence to major media outlets. Dr. Friedman is a New York Times bestselling author, and those books have included The Next 100 Years, The Next Decade, America's Secret War, The Future of War, and The Intelligence Edge. His most recent book, Flashpoints, the emerging crisis in Europe forecasts the turmoil currently being seen in Europe. Dr. Friedman received his bachelor's degree from the City College of the City University of New York and holds a PhD in government from Cornell University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. George Friedman. Uh, being at a conference on ethics and war kind of defines my life. I spent my first 20 years as a professor of political philosophy, spending my time wondering about what is ethical. I left. Uh, I loved my subject. I could tolerate my students, but my colleagues were unbearable. <laughs> so I left academics for another reason as well, which is that the more I studied, the more I found that I was persuaded that history is impersonal, that it is not a sphere in which individuals on the broadest level make much of a difference. They may well make a difference in whether or not we're going to fund a particular program, but the broad sweep of history that carries us along that we really have to understand uh, is really beyond the individual. It is impersonal, it is compelling, and therefore the question becomes, what is ethics in a world filled with necessity? There is certainly use of ethics, and I think the guidance comes from Aristotle in the distinction he draws between the good man and the good citizen, and the terrible tension that there is between the two. Because the good citizen must engage in the thing that is most common to this state, war, and the good man must engage in a thing most common to his private life, love. And the tension between love and war is very real, and yet not so real as you might think, because war itself is rooted in love, love of one's own. Uh, and private life exists only to the extent that we protect ourselves. At this point, I found that I was no longer welcomed in the faculty club. <laughs> and it was time to get out, so I started studying geopolitics with a passion. And instead of doing it in academics, I did it as a business. I don't want to ask for grants. It's humiliating. Uh, I, I don't really want federal contracts. It's debilitating. <laughs> but if I sell something for 100 bucks, then nobody can blackmail me. And I can say what I want. And it becomes a pleasure. So that's what I'd like to talk about, you know, what I've learned in doing this. And some of these things, if any of you had the misfortune to read my books, you may have heard, but some I want to repeat. And I want to start with something that every analyst who joins our staff, I go through with. I ask you to think about the summer of 1900. Europe dominates the world. The European imperial system is overwhelmingly powerful. Europe is amazingly wealthy, it is at peace. And the common sense of the time that everybody shares is this is the natural order of the world, it will continue. 20 years year later, Europe has ripped itself to pieces, a generation has been slaughtered, empires have fallen, it's been saved by this strange third world country called the United States who then leaves, and odd things have happened. But everybody knows one thing in 1920. 
Germany is finished. After this, Germany is not going to recover. Go forward 20 years to 1940, and Germany has conquered France. It is astride Europe as no one, including Napoleon, has managed to be. It is dueling with the British over the future of the British Empire. And the one thing that all common sense will tell you is this war is over. With the fall of France, Germany is ultimately invincible. They've imposed a new order. 20 years later, Germany is occupied by the United States and the Soviet Union, divided in half. The Soviet Union is allied with China. And one thing we know is that a war in Europe is almost inevitable. It will be a nuclear war. And the pivotal point is China, which we all know is completely insane. And once they get nuclear weapons, that's over. Move forward 80 years, China is allied with the United States against the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union uh, appears to be emerging as a great power. Uh, the occupation of Europe continues. But the United States has fought a war, of course not in the central, not by the full the gap, in Vietnam. And we lost. In 1980, one thing is certain, and the disarmament people will tell us that Russia is a permanent feature and we must be prepared to make an accommodation with them. 20 years later, the Soviet Union has collapsed. It no longer is. And now the common sense is that the real issues of our time are economic. Davos man has arrived. We do not have to worry about war any longer. And then 9-11 comes. Two things I want to draw from this. Common sense is the most misleading tool you can use to forecast events. And the second is what is now is almost inevitably not going to be soon. And that thanks us to the sandbox and the theory of the long war. We've been at war for 15 years. We have not done well. The idea that therefore we'll be there for 50 years is counterintuitive. Yet the common sense is that we must continue to train our force for the Middle East. Even though we already see the era turning with China and the South China Sea, with Russia and its new assertiveness, it's not yet clear what the next era is. But from a mathematical point of view, only one thing is certain. Not that it's a 20-year cycle, not that it's automatic or anything like that. It is that what you are concerned about now, at the beginning of your career, is not what you will be obsessed with in the middle of it, and likely have nothing to do with what you're concerned about at the end. One of the weaknesses of all military organizations is not that generals fight the last war, but that majors build their careers on the last war. And it becomes impossible to shift an army or a navy, sorry, uh, wrong service. Uh, it becomes impossible to shift, not because the generals can't change their minds. It's the majors and the lieutenant colonels that can't believe that the skills they've mastered in the battlefield no longer quite apply. And so one of the things I want to talk about, the thing I want to talk about is the next event. And I don't want to stand here as if I were praising European imperialism in 1900 and missing the First World War. I want to stand here saying, OK, we have been at this for 15 years. The probability of us being here for another 10 statistically is extremely low. It may happen, but it hasn't happened before. So what is it that is likely to happen? To understand what is likely to happen, I want to begin by talking about US strategy for the last 100 years, which has been operating on two levels. The real interests of the United States that matter, and the less important elective events, like the Philippine uprising or Iraq, that do not affect the existential existence of the United States. What does affect the United States? Eurasia consists of five-sevenths of the world's population. Five billion people live in Europe, Asia, the Middle East, 
China, India. That group of people and the resources of the Eurasian landmass can overwhelm the United States. The United States has two strategic interests. The first, the control of the sea. That is our barrier. That is not a trivial barrier. And I would disagree somewhat with Admiral Stavridis, which is that one of the pleasures of being American is that there are those seas. And if it doesn't buy us security, it buys us time. And time is sometimes more important than immediate security. The second thing is we do not want a unified Eurasia. A single power dominating all of Eurasia would almost certainly create a challenge to control the seas because of their resources. And therefore, the United States conducts a foreign policy, almost unconscious, that is designed to prevent a hegemon from arising. We can become more specific. Our primary interest is to make sure that Russia and Germany do not form an entente, either by one conquering the other or by an agreement. Agreements are better because they double cross each other, but lacking that, uh, we don't want a conquest. And for 100 years, this has been American foreign policy. After the Tsar fell in 1916, 1917 actually, the United States intervened in World War II. It did not intervene because of Lusitania. It intervened because if the Russians stopped fighting, which seemed possible at the moment, and they transferred their forces to the West, that, that force would overwhelm the British and the French. And therefore, the United States did something that had never happened before in history. They invaded Europe, if you will, from the west to the east, whereas everything else had been happening from east to west. And this began to transform the world. At the end of that war, having no clear strategic understanding, but also thinking they had reestablished the balance of power. And it's interesting to look at Wilson, because if he were a ruthless realist or a complete idealist, he did the same thing. He prevented the French from dismembering Germany, maintaining the balance of power in Europe, and hoping that it would maintain itself. Alas, the French folded after six months, uh, six weeks, I should say. That was not an option. Still, the United States hung back. It waited to see how things would evolve in domestic opinion but also in the war, intervening if Russia had fallen would have been a difficult strategic problem. Intervening if the British had capitulated because of the Battle of the Atlantic would have been a difficult problem. So the United States did what it does best and everybody criticizes it for. It did nothing until compelled by Japan into the war, but the United States didn't declare war on Germany. That was a gift from Hitler, which is a long story that no one fully understands. Now we begin to understand that apparently Hitler was on speed, according to a book that's been published, which suddenly explains some of the decisions this leading among them. At this point, the United States intervened and invaded Western Europe at the last possible moment, June 6, 1944, having allowed the German army to bleed itself to death, uh, the Russian army to bleed itself to death, invaded Northern Europe. They took Bulgaria, we took France. So one of us got cheated, I don't know which. <laughs> but at the end, the United States played a brilliant strategic game. And one of the paradoxes of American military thinking is the constant belief in the amateurism of American foreign policy. Whereas if you take a look at the First World War, you take a look at the Second World War, you see a brilliant strategy of allowing the balance of power to hold until it fails and buying as much time as possible before entering the conflict, but entering it at the decisive moment. Now, is this a matter of genius on the part of our generals? Is it brilliance on the part of our Congress? 
it is a necessary process built in. We cannot get there fast. It takes us a long time. Time to theater defines our strategy as waiting. Also, mobilizing a force defines a strategy, a whole bunch of things. Yet, what happens is that the necessary structures of American military planning and modeling create a consistent strategy that is successful. After World War II, the United States decided that this constant speeding up and rushing in is not going to be as good as staying there. We did not station overwhelming force in Europe. We stationed sufficient force to hold, we hoped, to provide the president the option of sending more troops. They were always provided, but as de Gaulle said, they may not arrive in time. Or going to nuclear weapons. But the strategy was the same. Prevent Russia from dominating Germany prevent Germany from dominating Russia, prevent German technology and Russian resources from combining, use the minimal amount of force necessary to maintain a balance of power, and if and when the balance of power shifts, then use main force at the optimal moment to take control. We won the Cold War too. Our record in significant strategic matters is superb. And it is one of the most interesting things about American writing on its own strategy is that it's perceived as fumbling and bumbling. The trick is never to read biographies, although I do, never to read commentaries by learned people, or self-congratulatory autobiographies by generals. Be stupid, which is a saying we have in our company, which we do very well. <laughs> by being stupid is just look at what happened. And the answer is, the stupid answer, we won. Now, walk the cat backward from that insight and assume for the moment that it wasn't an accident. If we look at it that way, then the United States, as many foreign powers view us in the long run, has had a wonderful, predictable record in foreign policy. And we respond now automatically. So when the Russians and the Americans began to duel in the Ukraine, it was inevitable that we would begin thinking about sending troops to Poland, ships to Romania, uh, that we would begin thinking about prepositioning weapons, that we would do all the things we know how to do, and that it would be done without anybody in the country really realizing it. Because when the Russians or the Germans act, the system is very much on automatic pilot. Not in the sense that we don't know what we're doing, but somehow we don't understand how embedded we are in a national strategy that has made us the dominant global power, I'll use the word, empire. Not in the sense that we have pro-councils in all the countries. It is simply that with 25% of the world's economy in our hand, command of the seas, and overwhelming ability to project force as the only power that can do that, that we have a powerful position such that everything we do intersects with someone else. We are incapable of making a decision on the import of bananas, real event, without shaking the Central America to its roots. No pun intended. It is impossible for when you're 25% of the world's economy not to be able to do that, not to do that. So the idea that you are both going to remain this powerful, 25% of the world's economy, and isolate ourselves is insane. But the United States was never isolationist. That's nonsense. We did not, before World War II, want to get involved in German politics prematurely. But we were deeply involved in Asia, not just the Philippines, but in China, 
in maneuvering against Japan and so on. We were not, in, they, we were simply a country that was being selective in how and in what sequence we got involved. Always hoping the door open to the possibility we won't have to. We also fought a series of other wars from the Philippines onward. Admiral Stavridis pointed out there were 75 interventions in the Western Hemisphere. After 1991, when the United States became the world's only global hegemon, where Europe's empires had been lost from its own, what I'll call brutality to itself, when the Russian Federation became the la last remnant of the Soviet Union, and in becoming the last remnant of the Soviet Union, for the first time in 500 years, no European power was a global power. And the only global power was the United States. At that point, we, we began to think we had elective options. Let's do something in Kosovo. We don't like the human rights situation. In Bosnia, it might happen here again. And we could do it with little consequence. When you're in that position, you can do it and one of the things about ethics in politics is sometimes forces you to do things or causes you to do things that appear to be ethical, except for the fact that anytime you bomb someone, it's not ethical. Don't do it because it's ethical. Libya was the primary case. The human rights groups wanted us to do something about Gaddafi. We were able to do something about Gaddafi. We killed him. That doesn't mean that what we did solved any problems in Libya. It just made us feel good. Well, when you're Rome, you get to feel good. When you're Britain, you can get to feel good. But we also had a series of other problems, which is to say that Al-Qaeda struck us. And our counter to that was not invading Afghanistan. We didn't quite invade Afghanistan. We hired an invasion of Afghanistan and then settled our troops, troops there. From this grew the idea that we were going to make Afghan, Afghanistan democratic. This was deranged. Afghanistan is an ancient civilization with its own moral and ethical values and own way of governing itself. The idea that the ethical outcome is to make it into Wisconsin is not only deranged, but it's impossible. How do you make Afghanistan into something that we would admire when they don't admire us? The same with Iraq. This is not arguing that the wars were unnecessary, but they have a common thing, Vietnam, Korea, the Middle East, what I call the secondary wars, without a clear objective that is obtainable by the troops available to fight it. The willingness to extend the conflict for purely political reasons, even though no re rational person believes you're going to improve the situation. What are these wars? Well, go back to the primary rationale of the United States. It fears a united Eurasia. It fears even part of a united Eurasia. We understand why. The American strategy at this point is to do everything it can to prevent that unification. It also, as part of this, is fear of rising regional hegemons. Our view of, of Yugoslavia was that its fragmentation was sat satisfactory to us. The rise of Serbia as an aggressive power threatened to reverse that. This is not in our interest. Therefore, the United States put in place a strategy not only of blocking Serbia, that was his first move, but of fragmenting Serbia because of a war. That in turn creating regime change, unrest, chaos, and uncertainty, and that is a satisfactory outcome. These are called spoiling attacks. In war, at least the army learns about spoiling attacks. When an overwhelming force faces you, 
and you are uncertain about your ability to resist, you don't wait there and hope. You launch an attack designed to throw the other side off balance. Either have him conclude that there's a larger force than he thought facing him, either have him have an argument at the senior staff level of what this is about, have him lash out in the wrong direction. In other words, confuse him. The process of confusing the enemy is fundamental. The spoiling attack is that. The attack itself, if you look at it by itself, is not rational. You do not have the power to do anything rational. You have the power to do something that appears on the surface irrational, but makes a great deal of sense. We did not have the power in the final exam to defeat the Chinese army in Korea. We did, however, manage to create an unstable situation in the Korean peninsula, which we still live with. And we managed to convince the Chinese that we are as crazy as they are. And part of creating an image of war is that you are quite mad. And the United States is perceived around the world as quite mad. Why did you go to Iraq? Well, I can't tell you, but I wouldn't go to sleep tonight and be too comfortable. In other words, one of the reasons is to predict un uh, instability, unpredictability. An aircraft carrier going from the Sea of Japan to Indonesia, or whatever it did, does not create that. Being willing to wage war, knowing that you are not going to win, knowing that you can't even give a criteria to victory, has value. This is what I call the pork chop hill paradox. If you ever saw the movie Pork Chop Hill, the question is asked, why are we defending this place? To show them that we'll defend it. Uh, sir, we're going up there just to show them we'll defend it? Yes, because if we defend this one, they won't go after another one. War is infinitely more complex than are written in our manuals. It is a game of guessing, it is a game of uncertainty, and it is a game where the one with the most resources so that he can lose them in playing that game does best. So we have a two-tier foreign policy. One tier is ruthlessly and mechanically rational. This is the one about making sure that Germany and Russia don't get together. It's an autopilot. The other is a series of random attacks triggered by whatever, human rights considerations of terrorism, that are not designed, and empirically we can see they're not designed, to reach a military conclusion, but to establish a degree of unpredictability in an utterly predictable foreign policy. Therefore, our foreign policy at its core is utterly predictable. We will intervene in Eurasia at the point where this instability the danger of unification exists. How do you manage your foreign policy rationally in a way when everything is ultra-rational? Create a dimension of low cost, pardon me to the dead, high outcome wars that change the psychological bearing of the enemy. Does it always work? Of course not. Nothing always works. But when you step back and look at a century of US military action, you either conclude that the dice are always coming up snake eyes, or you con conclude that there is a built-in structure in it that you may not be able to find in the chiefs of staff. Yet they do it, and they do it always. The situation we are in right now is that Eurasia is in complete chaos every part of Eurasia. The European Union is fragmenting. It is no longer a decision-making entity, or it makes decisions, and even Hungary laughs at them, okay? Russia is now facing exactly the same problem that the Soviet Union faced. High defense spending, low oil prices. And we see its financial situation deteriorating regularly it needs 70 to $80 a barrel oil. It has 50 
that creates instability within Russia because money is distributed from the center and now we have banks failing in the peripheral parts of Russia. We have people not being paid in the peripheral parts of Russia. And so we have Russia itself compensating with a set of bluffs. The attack to Syria had no strategic importance to the Russians, nor was it nearly that impressive. Half their planes were in operation at any time. And they had logistical problems. But they managed to convince the most important audience that they were a great power, and that was not CNN. It was the Russian people. It was the Russian people who will withdraw much hardship if they're a great power. But the point is the Russians aren't a great power. I mean, certainly stealing Podesta's email is boring. I looked at it. But hardly a geopolitical event of earth-shaking importance. Of course the Russians engage in propaganda. We do too. The Russians send out Sputnik and we send NGOs. And the Russians have been complaining about our NGOs for years. We staged the coup in Ukraine. A, a big mob showed up. It was declared to be democratic and the constitutionally elected president of the Ukraine was overthrown by a change of, by the parliament, changing the constitution at Sunday at 11 and impeaching him at 12. They deserve to be sure, any, why not? Because the next guy is not gonna be corrupt. <laughs> the Russians saw this as a terrible threat to them. They said, why are the Americans so interested in Ukraine? What is their intention? As Azerbaijani once told me about something he did, we're jerking your chain. <laughs> we have no intention, but it's very funny watching you fire your entire staff on the Ukraine because FSB missed the rising, missed the meaning, and then tried to have an uprising in eastern Ukraine that even the Ukrainian army put down. So how do you do that? The best thing that ever happened to him was Putin declaring this to be an invasion of Crimea. They were always there. They stepped outside the wire, now I've invaded. China is in a similar difficult position. It is an export junkie. And as an export junkie, it depends on its ability to export goods into a stagnant global market. As a result, it is having social instability and has imposed a dictatorship on China. It also sails ships around the South China Sea without ever firing at anyone. And even the Filipinos drove them off once. The strategy is to appear to be more powerful than they are. In the Middle East, in the end, it will come down to Israel, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey to work this out. I have no idea what it is going to be, but we won't like it. But whatever it is, we do not have the power or the interest to try to define the internal politics of the region. That's why there are regional powers. We are now in the middle of a major shift. What is happening is that Eurasia itself is being hollowed out. Russia is weakening continually. The Chinese economically are weakening constantly. The growth rate is now below the 8% they said they needed. It's now down to 6.5%. It is true that they have an aircraft carrier, but they do not have an admiral. They do not have an admiral who has ever fought a battle that combines cruisers, anti-air destroyers, submarines. We didn't have a good commander either. We wound up with Pearl Harbor, but we learned fast. They don't have any naval tradition. As we learned with the Soviet army, you can't count the tanks and draw the conclusion of what they have. You have to notice they have no sergeants. There are no NCOs and you don't go to war easily without NCOs. So we have these powers falling. Who's emerging? Japan. Japan is not emerging. It's always been the third largest power. And if you take my view on Chinese statistics, 
is the second largest economy in the world. It has a superb navy, it has an air force, and it has a bomb where if they turn one last screw, there'll be a nuclear power. So this is, in East Asia, a united, well-governed, and authoritative force. In the Middle East, the rising power is Turkey, which is reasonable because until 100 years ago, Turkey was the one that pacified the Middle East, the Arabs. If anyone can pacify the Arabs, it is Turkey. I don't want to be there. All right? And the third power is Poland, which is the funniest one. But if Russia is declining, and let me not just finally say, Germany exports 50% of its GDP. Fourth largest power in the world is dependent on exports into a stagnant world for 50% of its economy. Its exports fall by 10%, it falls by 5% GDP, and the European Union is falling apart. Germany is the next shoe to fall. We've seen every shoe fall, the Germans have pulled it together, but if you take a look at Siemens annual report, their exports rose, their profits on exports fell. They're doing what the Japanese did in 1988, 89. They're slashing uh, prices. They didn't do that for a while. But if the US goes into recession, which I suspect it will in the next year or two, its major market is going to cut back and the Germans will stagger. So who is left standing? That's the ultimate question, all geopolitical questions. Japan, uh, Poland will be left standing because it has a strategic alliance with the United States. What is that worth? Take a look at Israel, take a look at South Korea. South Korea was a nation of bad rice farmers. They had become as corrupt as we are at an even higher level. They ha are a major power. How? They had a strategic partnership with the United States. The United States had a strategic interest in making certain that they flourish. They didn't flourish. Being Rome's ally pays off. Being the favorite of Britain pays off. And the same with the United States. The point I'm making, and I will end here, is we are not as stupid as we look. As individuals, yeah, we're morons, all of us. But as a collective entity, American foreign policy is much more ruthless, much more predictable, much less forgiving than it looks. We have a national myth that we're such good guys we never are willing to tough it out. Nothing in our history, from our Civil War onward, gives anyone any reason to have that view. And so I'll stop right here, and I will throw it over to questions, violent outbursts, whatever it is. Well, who has the biggest interest in pacifying the Middle East? It's not the United States. Turkey is one country. For whatever it says, it cannot afford this chaos south of its border. Iran is another country that has been very busy in Iraq fighting the fight we wanted to fight. The Saudis just want to have their oil and would like not to be paid attention to so they may not get into the fight. As for the Israelis, they're in the best strategic position they've ever been in. Egypt is neutral and pro-Israeli. The Jordanians are a protectorate. Hezbollah has been chewed up in Syria. The Israelis are not eager to get involved in this fight. They will not get into the fight. So we look at Turkey and Iran as the two powers that will fight each other. But if you remember Ronald Reagan, when he got Iraq and Iran into a war, it was rather satisfactory to us. So how does it sort itself out? The regional powers will sort it, sort it out. There is no other alternative. And also it means that a lot of the Arab rising will be put down because neither the Iranians nor the Turks are Arabs, nor are they interested in Arab rising. 
And this goes back 500 years with the Ottomans. I believe deeply that it will put an ethical gloss over anything it does. Ah, uh, but that's my answer. <laughs> Look, we do have, when the price is low, we do have ethical interventions. I think Kosovo ultimately was an ethical intervention. Okay? Bombing the ship in the, the bridge in Belgrade was an ethical anomaly. So here's the problem with ethics. The intention is good. But there is no immaculate intervention. There is no intervention in which there will not be civilians killed. And I hold the ethicist responsible for those dead. I mean, who do I hold responsible for the bombing of the bridge in Belgrade? Well, those who thought it was a moral imperative for the United States to go to war. So the answer is, yes, there can be moral imperatives. But I'm not clear that those who argue for human rights are moral. I would question the demands they make, sometimes, and their failure to take responsibility for the outcome. So, in the United States, in Libya, something important happened. The, the moralists got their way, and they lost a tremendous amount of credibility. So I look at it now, and I say, I think ethics can play a part. And one of the ethical principles is that the noblest thing for a human being is to put his body between war and between his home and war's desolation. This is an ethical requirement. The oath many of you took to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, is a moral and ethical commitment. So what I will say is I think these things can matter, but I don't want to cede the ground to human rights groups as the owners of ethics. It is far more complicated. The United States acted ethically in World War II at, at the end. I was born in Hungary. My family was fed by them, even in, on the other side. That was an ethical action. They also failed to bomb Auschwitz because they didn't want to send 500 bombers. That was also an ethical action. So I regard ethics as infinitely more complicated than the way it's presented. And sometimes it is not clear what is ethical. So my answer is yes, it can, be, it can be motivated by ethics, but I don't believe that we can do that until we have it, have it out with those who claim to own ethical behavior. So from my point of view, Marines posted pictures of naked women, pictures at 11. You know, come on. <laughs> This is an ethical breach, that they did it for people that they knew, and that may well be it. But the idea that 19-year-old Marines are interested in naked women, are we really going to have a discussion of this matter? I mean, so what has happened, and I want this is important, is we have seceded a dichotomy between the moral values of the liberal left and morality. It is way more complicated than they think, and it's not clear that they are moral. So that discussion we'll have. Now in fact, I become professor again. And
ambitions or our own sense of self-importance. We may fight elected wars for Greece's cause. We may fight wars in Africa and in Iraq or in uh, Libya. Uh, in, the, in the long run, doing more harm than good because we think we have a penchant for whether or not it matters. We'd be better off. The invisible hand is going to come back and haunt you. Because in every century, going back many centuries, there has been a systemic war. Whether it's the world wars of World War of the 20th century, the Napoleonic Wars. And these were the wars that mattered, which if you lost, bad things would happen to you. It is possible the 21st century will be the first century without a systemic war. I'll lay long odds against anybody who wants to take that on. I can already see the war taking shape. It is the periphery of Eurasia, Poland, Turkey, Japan, who have interests other than those of the United States and will have space power and everything else to deal with it. If we look at the history of the 20th century, there were interventions in Haiti, in Nicaragua, in the Philippines, I said, there were lots of wars we, we carried out. The defining wars, of course, particularly was the Second World War, the Cold War. In the same way, we are only at 2017. We have not seen the hand play out of exactly when the systemic war will take place. My problem with the military is they spend a great deal of time preparing for the marginal wars. My fear is we won't be ready for systemic wars because who wants to spend money on a war that we can only imagine? And this has been the problem of American policy in World War II. Like the Poles, we didn't build an Air Force. Unlike the Poles, we had time to build an Air Force. If the time structure of future wars from a technical standpoint contracts so that our distances are redefined, we may find ourselves in the situation of having superb prototypes and no military. The challenge to the military is to believe two things. You will not be spending the rest of your career, unless you're ready to retire, on the sandbox. Number two, you will be fighting an enemy worthy of his steel, who knows what he's doing, why he's doing it, and has weapons. And because he's weaker than you, he's going to spend more time getting ready. So I would argue that these wars that we fight will be as well remembered as our intervention in Nicaragua. I mean, how many of us, we all were, some of us were alive during Vietnam, how, much, how many of us base our strategic thinking on what lessons learned in Vietnam? It happened, we lost, and guess what? It didn't matter. The Soviet Union still fell. So this is what we have to do to distinguish between, if I was an imperialist, I would call it imperial peacekeeping. If I'm not an imperialist, I'll call it human rights watch. Whatever you call it, it's the same thing. You go and shoot the bad guy. They have to debate who the bad guy is. But the challenge for the people in this room is to draw an ethical distinctions between elective wars and systemic wars. In elective war, you can set the rules any way you want because you're not going to win anyway. You're not there to win. So you can make clear that everybody has to be read their Miranda rights. You're going to lose the war anyway. You're there for that. But what do you do in World War II if you're England and you face the abyss? How much morality can you face or do you have Bomber Harris annihilate cities at night? Now, the, the moral way to do it, the British chose it, have, moral, have him do it and then condemn him later and deny him any honors. It's perfectly acceptable. It's the life you pick. But my concern here, because the question was raised on space warfare, of course there will be warfare in space. The American domination of space allows us to use targeting for PGM and new generations of hypersonic missiles that will finally have some decent range. Uh, 
That is our eyes and ears, even without putting the weapons into space. No peer power will go to war with us without blinding us in space. Therefore, we must have defenses for space, and we already do. I know we don't. I know the NRO never thought of this, and God knows, but let's assume that they did. We're already fighting a blind battle in space between various capabilities to kill our platforms and our ability to evade and kill the killers. We have to be. If we're not, court martial should be held immediately. The point I'm making here is these are the questions to ask. Here's another question to ask. It took us six months to get in a position to wage Desert Storm. It took about the same amount of time to deploy for Iraqi freedom. It might have taken a little longer. What are you going to do in a war when you don't have that time? You're taking a tank and putting it in a position that it can fire two kilometers. Good. Do you really need to put 50 tons of steel 6,000 miles away to deliver a munition on that spot that you want to? And the answer is we're already dealing with cruise missiles. They just don't have the range, and they're slow. Time becomes everything. We are used to having six months to prepare for a war. We do not have that time frame in the future wars, and therefore the systems we are using that take weeks and months to deploy are insufficient. We need to think about how to destroy things at distance against surface-to-air missile systems that have 100G maneuverability against pilots who turn to jelly at 20. So these are the things that morally we must think of because your obligation is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And in that case, that means ethically we are obligated to concern ourselves about the future. Sir. Ah, uh, Luban. <laughs> Then, then why are you asking me questions? You already read me. <laughs> He's an old friend. So excuse him. <laughs> With, with, with the fact that I had 40 minutes answered? One of the ways to destroy a military organization is to give it all the tasks they might be interested in. The military has a core obligation. And that core obligation is to fight wars and win them. Now, there are many other threats to the world besides war. And governments, or preferably non-government entities, should discuss them. All right? But in the end, we want too much of our officers. I want them to be as learned as they can be. I want them to be knowledgeable. I want them to know how to train men and women to fight. So. Every one of the things you said are worthy topics. The question is, is that a topic to which we want the bandwidth of the United States military devoted, or should some other people study it and then feed it into the system? I didn't talk about nationalism 
although I've written on it extensively, because it was a given in this context that this is what we're talking about. Uh, the problem we have is that we want soldier scholars, and I want them too. But the soldier scholars I have met were soldiers first. In a sense, their scholarship was optional. I want a Navy that really thinks how to control the sea against potential enemies. We have, should have a national health organization that worries about the pandemic. I want to really, one of the problems of the United States is that everybody in the government is doing everything. Because as soon as you bring up a topic that should be discussed, well, we better discuss it. We actually have a small cadre of officers, of those who are going to rise and, and run the military. And after they have learned the art of running a military and waging war successfully, they certainly should broaden their perspectives or on the way up. But I do not want, I don't want the main function, the main moral imperative of the military force diluted by other matters. There are military threats, that's their problem. There are medical threats, that's somebody else's problem. It can't all be done by the military or we do to the military what we did to the schools. Every social problem in the world, the schools had to solve. And they forgot the basic thing, teaching reading. So the problem of us institutionally, and I happen to be writing a book on this, is the inability to understand clear distinctions between organizations, their moral imperatives, and what they should study. I will happily talk about nationalism with you. I know nothing about pandemics, which has never between us stopped a long discussion from taking place, <laughs> since you don't know anything either. <laughs> but I want the people in this room to be thinking about wars. No, um, they, you know, non-nation states have been with us continually. Read the book of Maccabee, which is an apocryphal book, which is uh, part of the apocrypha, about uh, the Maccabees waging war against the Greeks. Uh, the Bible is full of non-nation states. All of them succeed when they become nations. David would have been a footnote to history if he didn't take Jerusalem. So. My answer is nation states have as their goals becoming, uh, non-nation state actors have as their goals becoming nation state, nation, national actors. ISIS differs from Al-Qaeda in strategy. Al-Qaeda wanted to overthrow some existing government and take control. ISIS wants to create its own sphere. But until you have the resources of a nation state, you're a website and an explosive. You're a pain. You're, you can do terrible things, but you cannot threaten the existence of a country, I think. Thank you very much. So uh, we have a small gift, the Stockdale Moral Compass, which uh, I, I trust you'll put on your desk and remind all those who work with you to keep that compass in the right, the right direction. Thank you for some very insightful comments, and you've given us much to think about. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, it's a real one. It's a real one.